All right? Thank you. Well, uh, yes. So I was wondering what to tell you today, but uh, you've heard quite a lot about non-locality. So that would be a wonderful subject to continue. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because it was already too much. Uh, you heard about time, but it was really time to finish it. And uh, <clears throat> so what I was thinking to, to do is the following thing. So, you know, many people have the feeling that quantum mechanics is extremely counterintuitive. And then after whichever way you count, a hundred years of quantum mechanics, we are still puzzled about it. And all kind of uh, new and surprising effects are discovered with, with quite annoying frequency. So that is a signature that we still do not understand quantum mechanics in a deep and intuitive way. And uh, my feeling is that there are at least three main things that one needs to, uh, to understand in order to have a chance of getting a better understanding of quantum mechanics. One of them is the fact that nature is non-local in the sense of Bell inequalities. And uh, this is something that has been ignored for many years, but during the last 20 years or so, after the advent of quantum information, a lot, a lot of research has been done in that direction. That is a type of non-locality that I will call it kinematic because it's really based on the Hilbert space structure of the space of states of quantum mechanics, but not on anything else. Then there is a uh, different thing, which is the fact that like in every probabilistic theory, if you, in quantum mechanics in particular, if you know the state of a system at a given time, and later you make a measurement, you don't know what the result of that measurement will be. Even if you know the Hamiltonian and you know everything else that is happening to the system. So then looking at a later time and actually making a measurement there gives you new information which didn't exist at the initial time. And this allows you by preparing it and then post-selecting for a given answer to put two independent time boundaries on a quantum system. And when you look at the time in between, that is determined by the two independent time boundaries. This is the whole idea of pre- and post-selection. And, um, well, Ralph will talk more about it. Lev Weimann will, will talk about it. So this is the second thing. And, well, it was discovered by, by Akira Haronov, and then all these ideas of weak measurements and so on, uh, they are becoming more and more popular. By no means are they investigated as much as, as Bell non-locality. But there is a third main uh, feature, like a third main column on which quantum mechanics rests, that I believe it is equally important, if not even more important than Bell inequality. And that is a phenomena that I call dynamical non-locality, which is another type of non-locality, completely different as far as we know from uh, Bell type non-locality and entanglement and things like that. Uh, it was discovered again by, uh, by Aharonov while studying the Aharonov bomb effect. And there are very few people that are looking into this phenomena. So I want to take the opportunity to describe you what it is and uh, why I believe it is important. So here it is. Let me look at the, okay. Physics works, yes, the feedback is okay. Uh, let me look at this most famous uh, experiment, 
in quantum mechanics, which is the double slit experiment. So you send here an electron that goes through these two slits, and here you have, well, the wave function goes there, and you have a screen there, and the electron will, will give a spot, and you repeat many, many times this thing, and in the end you, you end up with some interference uh, figure over there. On the other hand, if you close one of these uh, slits here, and the, the electron goes just to one slit, then you will no longer see the interference thing at all. Now this is the, you know, quantum mechanics 101 is the very first thing that you learn in quantum mechanics. And of course, many people discuss by the idea that it, everything looks like a classical optical interference thing or acoustic waves or waves on the ocean or whatever you want. And the interesting thing is that this is built up by points. In one experiment, you find a particle here. In another experiment, you find a particle there. And only when you build this thing up, you see an interference. So at the beginning of quantum mechanics, people had this idea that is a sort of wave particle duality, and many people concentrate on, on how it comes that apparently the particle will collapse in one point, but then the sum of all these collapses is like the interference. And that is a nice question, but there is actually something far more interesting going on. So I'm not going to talk about why it collapses. That is just the end of the experiment. There are far more interesting things going on. So you see, when, when the two slits were open, uh, you get one pattern. When you close one of them, the pattern changes. So you will, uh, for example, not see this interference, but you will see something different, like, you know, s something just, just like this. Uh, nothing nothing uh, very exciting. So that means something, that the particle from here originally could not come to that point, but now it can. So it means that the motion of the particle changes. And then it is surprising, because how did I change in? Well, I should have made this uh, smaller amplitude, because the probability is conserved. So how comes that I close this here, I close that entry, and the particle that comes from here changed its movement? So there is a, some smell of non-locality going on here. Okay, And I would like to dig a little bit deeper into, into that question. So, first of all, just closing a, a slit is a very drastic thing here. But um, you can imagine that you put here a spin, that you started with a spin up Z before you let the particle go. And if the particle goes through this slit, it will flip the spin, but if the particle goes through that slit, it will, the spin remain uh, unchanged. So if I start with a state like 1 over root 2 left plus right for the electron, self-explanatory, left and right, and with a spin up Z, that was at the beginning, now it goes through the slits, and this will evolve into 1 over root 2 left up z. So nothing happens to the spin when the particle was on the left, plus 1 over root 2 right down z. So the particle gets entangled with, with the spin. And therefore, people would say today that uh, because of entanglement, all the interference is, is lost. Um, there is a more interesting way of looking into it. Let me look in, not in the Z representation, but let me look in the X representation, where up Z equals up X 
plus down x over root 2. And this chalk is really not very good. Uh, we used to have much better chalk in, uh, in the other rooms. And down z, it's 1 of minus down x over root 2. Therefore, you can write this thing as being what? 1 over root 2. And here is the state left plus right over root 2. Up x plus 1 over root 2 left minus right down x. Ah, so that is interesting. Why is that interesting? Because now you see a little bit cleaner what is happening. So imagine that you have these two slits and you start with a state left plus right. Well, because it's symmetric, when they propagate, it will have a maximum of interference in the center and so on. But on the other hand, if I would have started with left minus right, would be like the wave function here and the wave function there, then, of course, in the middle you will have a zero of interference and you'll have things like this. And because in this state, sometimes I take one of them, sometimes I take the other, I will get a mess, which is the loss of the interference pattern. So the main lesson here is that the relative phase between left and right is the thing that determines the interference pattern. Okay? So that is the beginning of, of this uh, inquiry. Uh, let me... Oh, let me try to be a bit more... Okay. So what I'm going to look now is to look at some states. Let me use now the notation psi of x, index alpha. I really want to do better for these chalks. Uh, which is 1 over root 2, psi left of x, plus e to the i alpha, plus psi right of x. So I want to focus on the electron itself and look at 1 over root 2 for this whole thing. And look what happens when I change the relative phase. So I just presented there two extreme cases with a plus and minus, but I just want to look at the change of the phase. Now, what I would like to do, actually, is not focus on the wave function, because the wave function is not an observable quantity. It's not even gauge invariant. What you see, you are performing measurements, so you are looking at various observables. That is the key. So I would like to look at the, the wave function. Uh, in fact, let me just take a step even before this. Let me uh, let me do something else just before we start. Let me call e to the i alpha left and e to the i alpha right. One over root two. So I have a phase in front of this one, and I have a phase in front of that one. And you can modify the phases of both things. Now, you may imagine a classical experiment. For example, you know, this is a dam next to, here's the beautiful beach, and here is a dam with two holes, and water waves come through the dam. And here you have this interference pattern on the beach. I suggest that you do this experiment this summer. I definitely want to do that. And then you, you, you have Alice here, 
and you have Bob there, and they may look at the waves as they come, and they may have uh, a clock, and they look at a phase. And Alice tells that there is a phase called alpha left. Bob takes, looks at a phase, and it is alpha right. And later, they come together, they compare the two phases, and they say, ah, so we know how the interference thing will look on the beach. All right. That is almost identical to quantum mechanics. But the whole difference is in the world almost. Because what you know is the fact that this I can write as 1 over root 2 e to the i, say, alpha left, psi left of x, plus e to the i, alpha relative, let me just call that alpha, psi right of x, where alpha is alpha right minus alpha left. I can always take a phase out. In fact, I can take any phase out here. And the probability is given by psi of x absolute value square. So I can take any phase out, and it doesn't matter. The only thing that is relevant is the relative phase between left and right. So if this were a quantum particle, Alice cannot find alpha left. Bob cannot find alpha right. The only thing that has a meaning for the interference, is there a problem? Yeah, good. So the only thing that has significance is the relative phase, which is something, in some sense, a non-local quantity about these two. That's why I would like now to focus on, on this thing. OK, so let me get back to the, uh, to the main wave function that I would like to, to look at. And that is to take this phase out to take the right from there, to clean it up, and to look at genetically psi alpha, which are psi left plus e to the i alpha psi right. This is the state that I want to look at. And I want to look at various measurements that I do with them. So one question I can ask is what is the average value of x in the state psi alpha. Well, OK, here is where we depart from qubits, and it is very good to be able to do that. So this is the integral from minus infinity to infinity, psi alpha x complex conjugate times x times psi alpha x dx, which is the integral from minus infinity to infinite, what do I have? 1 over 2 in front, psi left of x complex conjugate, plus e minus i alpha, I complex conjugate the whole thing, psi right star of x dx, oh sorry, times x times psi left of x plus e to the i alpha psi right of x dx, which equals, I can decompose this into four integrals because I want to, uh, to expand uh, the, the brackets. So I have 1 over 2, the integral from minus infinity to infinite psi left star of x times x psi left of x dx plus the other integral minus infinite to infinite let me try another color maybe they are better psi right star times x 
Well, let me look at the phases. E to minus psi alpha, E to plus psi alpha, so they cancel. It's psi rai, dx, and plus the, the mixed terms. Each of them carries a 1 over 2 in front. Psi left complex conjugate, x, E to the i alpha, psi right, dx, plus 1 over 2, minus infinity to infinite, psi right complex conjugate times e to the minus i alpha times x psi left dx. Right. Okay. So I'm interested in how the expectation value of position depends on the phase alpha. Good. This term is independent of alpha, so I don't care about it. I will evaluate. This is independent of alpha. Uh, let's see, of x. How much is this term? OK. Let me draw your attention. This is psi left. This is psi right. And the integral is psi left times x times psi right. How much is the integrand? Zero. Absolutely. Because where psi left is non-zero, psi right is zero in that location. And where psi right is non-zero, psi left is zero. So this term is zero, and that term is zero. So that means, if I uh, would look here, let me make here a little. So the absolute, the uh, average value of x is independent, independent of alpha. What about x to the power n? x to the power n. Well, x to the power n, I just have to put an x to the n here. So x to the n there. I just put an n everywhere here. But it doesn't modify the fact that where psi left is 0, where psi left is non-zero, psi right is 0. So those terms do not count. So that means that the average of position of all powers of position, is independent of alpha. So it's not sensitive, the it's not sensitive to the interference. I look at the average of position, it has nothing to do with the interference. OK, but obviously what is interesting is the fact that a particle changes its momentum, because previously it was, able, was not able to come to a minimum of interference, now it can. So definitely in the momentum, there must be the game. So let me try to look now at things with momentum. So let me ask, what is the expectation value of the momentum? OK. So the momentum operator is to take minus i, I forget h bar, no, I will not forget. Minus i h bar d over dx of that thing. So I have to, to look at this. I know Tony loves h bar to be 1, but not everything that Tony loves is I have to do. Minus i h bar, I will have here d over dx of that thing. So now I have to be a bit more careful. I will have to clean these things up. Oh, come on. Let me just do it from the beginning. So it is psi left. I can take from all of the minus ih bar out, so I will not carry them. d over dx psi left dx plus the integral minus infinity to infinite uh, psi right 
complex conjugate d over dx psi right dx. No phases here because psi right complex conjugate carry e to minus alpha. Here it's e to the alpha. And now we come to the interesting terms. Psi left complex conjugate d over dx psi right. And this carries e to i alpha in the psi right plus the integral from minus infinity to infinite psi right complex conjugate d over dx psi left dx and this carries the psi right e to the minus i alpha. I presume you cannot see I'm writing too small, yes? From the back or can you see it? Well, the point is, what is this integral? Uh, these are the only ones that depend on alpha. So I have psi left times the derivative of psi right. But psi right is only here. So if I take the, uh, if I differentiate it, it will still be only there. Here it is constant, will be zero. So these terms will disappear. So that means that the expectation value of the momentum is independent of alpha. So the momentum really doesn't care about alpha. That is, its expectation doesn't care about the interference. So what happens with some other power of momentum? Perhaps the spread of momentum will change because previously it went here, now it goes there, now it goes there. So all I have to do, I will have to take everything to the power n. So d over dn of this thing. So that will not change my things at all. Because even if I differentiate n times the function, it will still not change the fact that I just differentiate here as many times as I want this function will still be zero at that location. So it means that none of the, let me call k, the powers of momentum depend on alpha. Hmm. But the only observables in the game are position and momentum. And it's very easy for you to follow in the same thing to look that any, you know, thing like this is independent of alpha. So none of the averages of the observables are sensitive to the interference. Of course, later, when they come together, the position will, will be sensitive to the interference. But that information must have been present in the state already from the beginning. When you have some e to the i alpha here, that will modify the interference pattern. So then the question is, which is the relevant observable that encodes things about the interference? OK. All right. So try to guess till I'm uh, going to clean up the board. Okay, any guesses from people that haven't heard this talk before? No, okay. Let me look at the following thing. Let me look at e to the i pl over h bar. P is the momentum. Let me take L to be the distance between these two things. I will look at the average of this guy. It's non-Hermitian, but I will then look what is the cosine of this and so on. That, this is simpler to do. So this is the average of this. 
let me do like for my students to put a hat on the momentum so it's clear. It is the integral for minus infinite to infinite, 1 over 2, psi alpha of x, complex conjugate, e to the i, pl over h bar, psi alpha of x, dx, equal. Well, what happens when I apply the operator e to the i, pl, over h bar to psi of x. Well, if you do the calculation, you see this is nothing else than the shift operator. It shifts the function by L, whether by plus or minus L, I never remember. So this is 1 over 2. You do the Fourier transform. You work in, in momentum space. Then you do the Fourier transform back, and it's, it's pretty trivial. So you get psi star alpha of x times psi alpha x minus l dx. Ah, oh, we are getting somewhere now. So let's see. This equals 1 over 2 in front, the integral from minus infinity to infinite. Of course, one of them is psi left complex conjugate of x plus E minus I alpha psi right complex conjugate of X times psi left of X minus L plus E to the I alpha psi right X minus L dx equal 1 over 2, and I have four terms now. Oh. Which one goes up? Nope. Okay. So it is the integral from minus infinite to infinite. Let me take these two. Psi left of x, complex conjugate, psi left of x minus L dx. The first term. How much is this? Well, psi left of x and the psi left that is moved here. Well, it's zero. So that is zero. Plus the integral minus infinity to infinite psi right complex conjugate of x times psi right of x minus L dx. No phases because these two things cancel. And again, is psi right, complex conjugate, it still leaves it there. And here is psi right of x minus L, so there is no overlap. The integrand is 0. Plus the integral from psi left star of x, psi right of x minus L dx. This carries an e to minus I, uh, uh, where does it carry? E to the I alpha on psi right. So it is psi left multiplied by psi right that is translated there. Uh, this is also zero. And then you have uh, the last one, which is E to the minus I alpha, the integral minus infinity to infinite, psi right, of x complex psi right uh, times psi left of x minus l dx. So I have psi right here and psi left that is shifted on top of it. So if I would have taken uh, this to be normalized wave packets, then this would be just one there. All the others are zero, so the only thing I'm left is this with a factor 1 over 2 in front. So that means that if I look, most probably I should have shifted it the other way, looking the fact that is, well, whatever. Uh, so if I look at the expectation value of e to the i p l over h bar 
and I look at the average value of it, well, that is, in this case, half minus i alpha. So this is the operator that is sensitive to the interference. It is the only operator up to trivial uh, versions of it. And it is a non-local operator in the sense that it takes away function from here and shifts it over there. All the others are local, like momentum itself is a local differential operator. You just make a derivative, which means you look between the wave packet and the wave packet translated infinitesimally. That means to take, a, to differentiate. This is a shift. It takes it from here and moves it there. Mathematically, it's an interesting thing. And uh, you can take it as an exercise to see how is it possible that you have, you see, look, look at the operator, look at the momentum operator, and look at the probability distribution of momentum. So you can find, you can find this value and that value if you look in the momentum representation. I will, uh, let me bring the other one. So if you look at the, I'm using this color chalk because the other one is, is very bad. It's not because I want to emphasize anything. So if you look in the momentum representation, the average of momentum is nothing else that you integrate momentum times the probability of having some certain momentum from minus infinity to infinite dp. So when you look, you want to analyze momentum or any power of momentum, you have this. It's like a, a problem of classical probabilities. You have some probability. And I put here, it's the probability with index alpha because it depends on, uh, on the wave function. And the expectation value of e to the i PL over h bar in momentum representation, again, is nothing else than e to the i PL over h bar times the probability index alpha of P dp. And you find that this is independent of alpha, while this, you find it's 1 over 2 e to the minus i alpha. So you get a funny thing. You get that you have a probability distribution whose moments are independent on alpha. All moments are independent on alpha. But nevertheless, they are not the same because there is some function that if I apply to it, depends on alpha. Uh, it's possible. But you, one People, when they are sloppy and they don't tell you things precisely, tell you, if I know all the moments of a probability distribution, I know the probability distribution. That is false. That is only true provided certain assumptions. And those assumptions do not work here. Why don't they work here? Ah, that's interesting why they don't work here. Um, Basically, they don't work here because the wave function from which you start is non-analytic. You have the two wave packets, one here and one there. Again, uh, when I was a student, um, I always had this impression that, you know, analytical functions are the ones that are interesting. And non-analytic are just some pathologies. You know, you get some, something dirty there, and it's non-analytic. But analyticity, you know, sine and exponential and Gaussians, that is a horrible, horrible uh, optical illusion. Because 
what does it actually mean to have an analytic function, is a function that you can decompose in Fourier series around any point. So take this point, Fourier series means you look at all, you, you, you differentiate it here. And from that, you can construct the value of the function here. So it means that all the information about this function is contained in this region. Now, suppose I have a function like that, and now I modify it like this, you know, without changing anything there. It's obvious that I'm not going here if I do the, the Taylor series. I'm not going to find anything there this, about this dirt. But we need to have non-analytic functions because we want to talk about local actions. I do something here. If everything would be built out of analytic function, would mean that this information exists anywhere in the universe. So non-analytic functions are really at the base of all the interesting phenomena that are in quantum mechanics. Yes, please. Oh, yes, absolutely. You just translate the thing. That, that is, it's very robust. You, you can apply it. But you don't do it, you don't do it by decomposing it. Uh, you see, the temptation would be here. Let me now decompose this as a series, sum over uh, whatever, sum over, <laughs> sum over uh, some L. I know, I, L over H bar to the power L uh, times P to the power L over L factorial. And now you know that all the moments are independent, but this depends. Okay, so um, we should understand this uh, um, translation operator here as a, just a... Is that translation? It is. You, you, do it, you, do it, you do it by doing the Fourier transform, not by decomposing it into powers. And the reason why you cannot say you can... You are, you are welcome to put this in here but you cannot exchange the sum with the integral. That's where the, the mathematics trick comes. But okay, that's, that's the mathematics behind it. What is important, what is fundamentally important, is that you have an operator that is a non-local operator. It's one that takes the function from here and maps it there. I don't claim necessarily that you can measure it instantaneously if we are in... Uh, not relativistic quantum mechanics, but that is the only object that contains information about the interference. Now, let me try to tell something more about it. Suppose I have a Hamiltonian, some... Uh, standard Hamiltonian. So suppose I have the Hamiltonian that is P square over 2M plus V of X. So to this electron, I, I'm now working, you know, in, in just one dimension. I don't do it two-dimensional. All this was just function of X. So I want to know how does... Uh, the, how does the expectation value change? So I'm interested in what is e to the i pl over h bar, what is d over dt of this operator, okay? Well, one way to do it would be to say, well, I can, I can say that this is d over dp. Uh, suppose I would, I would work classically just to see how I get. So I would look at d over dp e to the i pl, oh, sorry, d over dt e to the i pl over h bar. That is like d over dp e to the i pl over h bar times dp over dt. So this one is I L over H bar times E to the I P L over H bar. 
and dp over dt is the force, and the force is minus dv over dx. That is what you, you would expect. So, can I do that on the operators? Well, the point is no, you cannot do that. Uh, what you have to do, you have to apply the Heisenberg equation of motion for it. So, what is the Heisenberg equation of motion? Well, this equals, I don't know, I over h bar, the commutator between the operator e to the i pl over h bar with the Hamiltonian. That's what you have to do. Right. Okay. So what is this? This is i over h bar, and I have e to the i, uh, well, let me first simplify this. Where, where do I put it? Okay, let me always put it there. So this is uh, i over h bar, and I have the commutator e to the i p l over h bar with p squared over 2m plus b of x. But of course, this commutes with p squared, so I can't forget about it. So the only thing is the commutator of this with v of x. So it's i over h bar, e to the i p l over h bar v of x minus v of x e to i p l over h bar, which equals i over h bar. Let me take, um, say, this thing out, e to the, uh, well, if I take this thing out at the other end, well, let me take this one out, e to the i p l, and I have v of x minus, because I took the operator out, I have e to the minus i p l over h bar v of x e to the i p l over h bar of the thing. Equal. Well, we are getting there. i over h bar e to the i p l v of x minus well, this is an operator, V of x, and when you apply the shift operator from the two things, you do the unitary transformation. You transform this, it's V of x minus L. So this is, I can divide by L and multiply by L, and I'm going to get something nice. Let me... Why don't I write the results higher up? So the classical thing, if I recall, is d over dt e to the i pl over h bar, that equals i l over h bar, e to the i pl over h bar, times minus dv over dx. Quantum mechanically, d over dt, e to the i, the operator p l over h bar, equals i l uh, let me take this. It's I L over H bar E to the I P L over H bar V of X minus V of X minus L. Right. Divided by L. This is almost identical to that. But here, I differentiate. It's a local thing. D 
This is V of X minus V of X plus epsilon over epsilon. Here it's V of X minus V of X minus L. So the change in this shift operator, now you see better uh, what is happening. Not only that this is a non-local operator that moves things from here to there, but it obeys a non-local equation of motion. What it happens to it depends on the difference of potential between a point x and a point x at a bigger distance. So that is what is actually happening there in, uh, let me see, in even the simplest experiment, in, uh, in the two-slit experiment. So once you understand this, you start understanding many things. First of all, there was a debate at some time which, um, which puzzled people. And the question was the following. Uh, I have this beautiful interference pattern when the two slits are open, and I have some uncertainty relation, delta x, delta p. Now I come and I interfere with the thing. I put that spin so I, I know which, which way it went. So what happens, with the, what happens with the uncertainty relations? Now it becomes more messy, the interference pattern. When it previously it was that beautiful thing, now it's just a mess. So obviously, this thing should increase. It should become more uncertain. You don't know exactly where the particle is. And you calculate it. And you find, no, 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 no. Actually, delta x, delta p goes down considerably. Whoops. And this uh, challenged people for quite a while. So first of all, how is it mathematically possible that it goes down? Well, because originally you were never close to h bar, to the limit. You had a very high uncertainty. So there was plenty of space to go down. There is no contradiction in that. But here is the interesting thing. Do the Heisenberg equation motion tell us anything about interference? Any guess? What is delta x? Delta x is defined by the average value of x squared minus x average square, square root. Delta p is the average p square average minus p average square. Do any of these quantities depend on alpha? No. So Heisenberg uncertainties don't tell us anything about the interference. They are good for other things, but they are not good for the basic quantum effect, which is the two-slit interference thing. Okay. Uh, let me see, what else can we do? Uh, we can have a couple of more minutes. Mm. Let me take five more minutes. Uh, and uh, I can do the following thing. Let me give you a nice example of evolution. Suppose I have a... Uh, I have a capacitor here, so two plain... Uh, pieces of, of metal, that is, I can charge and discharge. Well, let me start with the charged, I don't know, minus, plus, and so on. And let me have an electron that I prepare in a superposition of being here and there. Okay? Now, what is the potential? Well, as you know, the force outside a capacitor like this with infinite plane sheets is zero. There is no force because the, the electric field cannot decay from just one 
one sheet like this because it's infinite. So the electric field created by this one is the same in magnitude as the electric field created by this one, but with opposite signs. So there are no forces outside. But there is a force here. So the potential will look something like that. Uh, so now, for simplicity, imagine that you start with a particle, the electron, with a very big mass. So actually, the Hamiltonian is just this potential, V of x, that has this form. And I start with psi left and psi right. So then psi left is an eigenstate for it. It just stays there because it has no kinetic term. I took it very messy, just to simplify the problem. This one stays there. So psi, the Hamiltonian applied to psi left is, let's call this, minus v0 and here v0. You know. So this is uh, minus v0 times psi left, which means that the unitary evolution of this is that psi left at time t is psi left at time 0 times e to minus i v0 t over h bar. And that's it. It just accumulates a phase. It's an eigenstate. Uh, similarly, if I look at psi right, h psi right is v0 psi right, so it is an eigenstate of energy with eigenvalue v0, so psi right of t equals, psi, well, it's a plus sign, yes? It's e to minus i times the energy times time over h bar. So this is psi right of 0 times e to the minus i v0 t over h bar. So if I would start with a uh, with a relative with a superposition, <laughs> if I were to start with a superposition of psi left at time zero plus psi right of time zero, that would evolve into psi left at time 0 of x. I'm not writing the coordinate e to the i v0 t over h bar plus psi right of 0 e to the minus i v0 t over h bar. So that means that it will accumulate a phase, which is 2, this alpha would be 2 v0 t over h bar. So it just gets a phase. So the momentum changes of the electron. Well, the modular momentum, that e to the i thing. I call it a modular momentum because it's an exponential, e to the i p. So it is modulo 2 pi. You don't measure the momentum, you measure the momentum modulo 2 pi. That changes. Yes, it changes in time. But there are no forces acting on this particle. So you can have a change of momentum without force. That is the aharonov bohm effect. This is the scalar aharonov bohm effect. Uh, more interesting is what happens. Momentum is a conserved quantity. So something must happen to the capacitor. OK. Uh, I already wrote this evolution. So because I wrote this evolution <coughs> without things getting entangled, it means that I didn't really affect the state of the capacitor. So the state of capacitor doesn't change. The state of the electron changes. The momentum that is lost by the electron must be picked up by the capacitor. But I see no change in the state of the capacitor. How is that possible? Okay. 
Well, I leave this as a puzzle for you. Uh, it has been solved, so it's nothing new, but you do it and then you start learning more things. But the main message is that at the level of equations of motion, physics, quantum mechanics is non-local. And the main interesting uh, effects, like the two slit one, is encoded in these non-local things. The Schrodinger equation looks local, <coughs> but that is an optical illusion. It is local, but it refers to the wave function, which is not an observable quantity. When you look at the equation of motion for observables, then you find out that they are non-local. This is already apparent at the level of a single particle. It has nothing to do with entanglement. It has nothing to do with Bell inequalities. You can play around and find a lot of very interesting effects. And I recommend you look in the book of Aharonov, The Quantum Paradoxes, Aharonov and Rorlich, and uh, just have fun. I believe this is an unexplored area which is equally, if not even more, interesting than, than non-locality that we, including myself, been exploring. So uh, just enjoy. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Sander. Uh, do we have time for questions? Uh, no. Yes, I, I will have a phone call at one, but we have five minutes. Okay, then maybe a couple of questions. I can always count on Lev. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you for the lecture. Uh, so I was wondering, um, a little bit, there, there is this argument about um, analytics, analytical um, functions and local actions. Yes. So you said at some point that... Uh, um, well, you take an analytic function, you do a local action, it will no longer be analytic. In other way, you look at the Hamiltonian of the local action, that is non-analytic. It means the fact that I do here, you know, you have to apply some potential here, not over there. So the potential that you apply is non-analytic. If and everything that you would do would be analytic, we wouldn't discuss about special relativity, about anything else, because everything would be known everywhere. And the, there was this argument that uh, implies signaling in some way, like that, that what no. is done locally is known. No, 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 it, it doesn't imply signaling. You cannot signal with these things. With these things, you can... Uh, so this is the interesting thing. You stay there next to that wave packet, you cannot see anything. It's the, moment, the, the modular momentum that change, but that depends on the two wave packets. So you can only measure that thing when you bring the two-way packets together to interfere. So this is a type of non-locality. You start with a source from where the two-way packets go. They go through the two slits. They come back together. If you go and follow the thing, if that you take as a definition of being non-local, you will hear more from Lev, I'm almost sure, in a second. So if your definition of non-locality is Look, I just go with this, with this wave packet where it is. It started at the source. I go with it all along, and I look at it. I go, Alice goes along with the other wave packet. None of them can tell that anything happens. At looking at the electron, the effect is non local. The question is can this be explained by local actions at the capacitor? That's a different thing altogether. But there is an inherent non-locality in the sense that any lab that follows the wave packet doesn't know what is happening. Okay? And the capacitor is a different thing because the electron being there applies a force on the capacitor. The capacitor will not move its center of mass because it applies equal force on this one, on that one. It will 
pull them a little bit apart. And when it is there, it applies. So you can see the, the non-locality. Maybe you can, maybe not. There is still an ongoing controversy uh, looking at the, uh, at the uh, capacitor. But as far as the electron is concerned, the effect is purely non-local. Okay? Do you still have a question then? Yes. I truly second your statement that this is a beautiful uh, unexplored field, all this non-local uh, way of looking yes. uh, at quantum mechanics. Uh, but I think from foundational point of view, it's important that uh, there is no red herring, there is no illusion about locality of Schrodinger equation. Uh, these non-local equations are for non-local variables, which is not particularly strange. If you have only local variables, then everything should, can be explained locally. But the local variables are precisely the one that tells you precisely nothing about the effect. So you may very well look at the local variables and say, wow, they don't tell me anything. And you would be right, but you would miss the point. I agree that we, <laughs> that sh we should look on non-local variables. They can give us intuition. But you want to understand if the nature is local or non-local, existence of local variables which can explain everything tell us that the nature is local. It well, has entanglement as the, non the only non-local property of the nature. But there is no any kind of action at a distance. You move your capacitor, nothing ha changes f f far away. Wha what I love is... Uh the fact that this is not a question but a statement, <laughs> with which I don't agree. <laughs> okay, good. Anything else? Yes, please. Last question. Uh, if you're looking at a framework of Belmont locality, like uh, Scarano told you yesterday, uh, one of the things that makes uh, probability in quantum theory uh, that are beyond the classical, it's the fact that some measurements cannot commute. In this case, you can talk about something about non commutation of some operations or mean measurements. Well, not everything is encapsulated in uh, the fact that things don't commute. Uh, you the, the effect here is of a completely different nature. Um, you have something else. You have some absolute uncertainties in this game. Like, for example, what happens with the momentum of the capacitor that does not change, does not change at all. So it means it doesn't change at all because it was completely uncertain. Now, the momentum can never be completely uncertain because it's an unbounded variable. But the only part of it that changes is the cosine, well, e to the i p l, which is a modular thing. That is bounded, and that can be completely uncertain. So I can talk here about, not about two things that don't commute and therefore they have an uncertainty relation. I get one bigger and the other one gets smaller or things like that. I can talk about uncertainty of a single variable, which is this type of, uh, of modular thing. So, I tell you, this is an, an entire area that is basically unexplored. So, don't expect that all the answers are there. Uh, the basic ideas are clear. But what are all the consequences and beautiful effects uh, is just the very beginning. Okay. Okay. Let's thank Sandra well, again. Well, thank you.